let's talk. Okay, everyone in Zoom. Um, so uh, we're going to start the presentation here. Please keep your uh, um, questions in the chat. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll address those. Um, without further ado, this is Paul Erickson. He has a uh, channel rare dragon fruit, um, and he isn't. He is a he's a guru. So listen to what he has to say. Dragon fruit nerd. Um, hi everybody, nice to see you. Thanks for coming. And uh, I did this for the festival production tour this year, and then I kind of revised it, and then uh, I was asked to do it tonight, and so I'm happy to be here. It's great to be here, and we'll go ahead and get started. So. Uh, yes, I do run a YouTube channel. That's our website that will take you straight to it. So if you're ever tired or can't sleep and you want to learn dragon fruit and fall asleep, it's a great place to go. Um, and then here's my friend, Leo Manuel. He passed this year. I'm sure you guys know. And then here are, is a picture that uh, William Chow told me at the festival. He took that picture long ago of Paul Thompson in the middle, left is Edgar Valdivia, right is Leo Manuel. So let's go ahead and see what we did here. It's an old picture. It is. Yeah. It is an old one. He said he took it quite a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, be, uh, 25, 30 years old. Yeah, he was at the festival and he came up at the end and he said, Did you know I took that picture on the front? I was like, Okay, I'm giving you credit, sir. <laughs> um, so now, uh, the California Rare Fruit Growers, you guys know it better than I do, of course, but it was established by Paul Thompson and a man named John Riley in 1968. And from what I've gathered, uh, white flesh dragon fruit on Datus was kind of what people grew. And then in the 80s and 90s, a lot of immigrants immigrated to the United States and brought their cuttings with them from, uh, from Central South America and Philippines, uh, Thailand, all around the world. But dragon fruit is native from uh, basically Mexico down into Peru. So as we uh, progressed in the 80s and 90s, we got more varieties for the rare fruit growers were growing them. And then members began to hybridize and grow seedlings. And most people think it was Paul Thompson, but it was actually a man named George Emmerich Jr. And he had George Emmerich Sr. who was best friends with Paul Thompson. And this is George Emmerich Jr. here a little before he passed. He right. died as well. Um, he was a rare fruit grower, I believe, if not his dad was. And he just kind of hung out with and shared a lot with the rare fruit growers in the 90s for dragon fruit. And he actually, in Paul Thompson's book, which Leo Manuel actually wrote, and I'll get to that later, um, this is in the text. And it says that George Emmerich Jr. gave him Undatus crossed with polyrhizus. So in my, what I've read so far is George Emmerich Jr. is the first dragon fruit or pita uh, hybridizer. So uh, sadly, his seedlings died uh, when he gave the, them to Paul Thompson. And yet he grew quite a few dragon fruit varieties. And from my, what I heard, he just grew seedlings and shared them. I gave them up. Good buddies with Peggy Winters. Yes, I do have, um, I have a Peggy Winters mango. I do have that okay. from Leo. Great. So um, he knew that. And then this lovely lady here was a, a blogger, but she was really good friends with George. And they did a lot with fruit. And when he passed, George's brother actually called her and said, I'm getting rid of all the plants because he had a lot of sapote trees and different things from what I heard. And I never got to go there. I tried to find it once and um, my kids want to go home. So I ran out of time, but I almost found it, his house. But anyways, his brother leveled everything. But before he did and got rid of all the plants because it was too much water, um, I actually, this lady saved 48 of his cuttings. And she lived along the beach and then moved to Hawaii. And it just, I happened to email her and she said, I don't want them. Come pick up these plants. And so I have 48 of George Emmerich Jr.'s plants. They went to every plant and cut a cutting and grew it. But they grew along the beach and like just a little north of um, San Onofre area. Mm -hmm. And it was really coastal. The plants were barely, barely alive in leaf litter. And so I've evaluated some. And then this season, I got this one really exciting. It's number 20. And I've, I've given away a few and shared some other cuttings. And some are definitely repeats. Some are white flesh, not very good. But this number 20, I'm really theorized that it's one of his hybrids where he crossed that polyrhizus and undatus because you can see the shape of the fruit's really unique. It looks like a white flesh. And then I cut it and it was a really deep red. Um, so I'm evaluating this plant still. It's very sensitive to the sun but it was a delicious fruit. So I'm excited just to have 48 of George Emmerich Jr.'s plants 
Um, but nothing really came out that just was a wow yet. I mean, this was probably one of my favorites. Uh, so hopefully you know Paul Thompson. Uh, he passed in 2008, and he is the official author of the Pita Haya book. And again, I'll talk a little bit how Leo actually wrote the book um, and just took Paul's dictations. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But Paul Thompson, to me, is one of the famous, most famous hybridizers. He did a fortuitous cross we'll talk about. And honestly, one of his varieties is, is the biggest one growing commercially in San Diego, which is physical graffiti. Here, football. Yeah, I wouldn't be here today. I mean, most of us, none of us would be here. So he's really the founding father. Um, and I consider him, the, I mean, he did a lot with mangoes. We know another fruit, but his dragon fruit crosses are just amazing in my opinion. We'll talk a bit about them. He shared them with a lot of you. So if anybody has a 4S, I'm still looking for that. It's been like my dream for three years. That's white flesh. It's gotta be like a pale pink inside because I actually got three cuttings of his 4S that people got from Paul Thompson himself. And they've all ended up being magenta inside this year. So I don't have it. So I was, I'm looking for it. It's like the chase and the dragon. Um, this is uh, Alice Snow. I got to meet her at Paul Thompson or uh, Leo Manuel's memorial. And she told me a little bit about, um, she has a variety named after her as well. It's called Alice or Alice Snow. Alice Snow. Uh -huh. That was named by, uh, uh, ja uh, I mean, um, Neitzel, Jim Neitzel. Okay. So you taught me something already. Thank you. Um, I have some of those cuttings at home if you'd like them. Well, I got if okay. some from her, or Leo still had one. Okay. But um, she told me that actually that one that was named was one of Paul Thompson's Undatus. Okay. So small world, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then um, this is actually... Last week. Yeah, she's doing well. Yeah. It was great to see her and Dick. Seen, uh, but yeah. she she's allergic to actually... She became allergic to the pollen of dragon fruit. So she had Romero Lobo take all of her plants. They donated them. So she doesn't grow anymore, but really nice people. Um, that's a screenshot of the first Pita Haya book. They almost put that photo in it, but then you can see that uh, Leo crossed out rainbow, put Bonzo, but for some reason that's only in the rough draft of his book. So I just really like that photo for some reason. So Paul Thompson's book, if you need it, send me an email. I have it as a PDF. I'd be happy to give it to you. Um, to me, I think it's one of the most useful resources shared across the world. Um, just last night, I sent it to Egypt because Leo told me he gave me the PDF and said, anybody that's interested, share it. So I said, OK. And so, I, sh I mean, people in Egypt, Israel, South America, people around the world, I just email them the PDF. Uh, I find Vietnam is very big on. Vietnam. Yes, yes, they are as well. Actually, Leo had a book. It's, I think it's in Vietnamese. I, I'm not sure, but I use Google Translate. I'm trying to learn from it. Um, but in this book, it's very helpful. But then it also has his unknown varieties, which I'll talk a little bit about because I kind of found almost all of them from Leo and some other people. And some of them have been renamed over the years. Um, fun fact, Leo Manuel wrote the book on Microsoft Word in the early 2000s. And what Leo told me is he, Paul Thompson's wife had dementia. And he would go once a week and they'd go and write out the book in the basement. And so over the years, Leo collected a lot of cuttings from Paul. They traded things. Um, and Leo was so humble. He actually printed the book. He distributed the book. But you see, he never really took credit for putting in all that effort. And so he told me these things. And I just, um, very humble man. Leo and uh, Dick and... Um, um... I'm trying to think of a team. He used to live out off the Boston Drive, uh, Jack Skeels. Yes. He used to go to uh, breakfast or brunch quite often at the uh, little Sunshine Deli in uh, Casa de Oro. Uh, it, yeah, I have one of Jack Skeels' uh, polyrhizus. Yeah. I have one of his plants, and it, they yeah. call it Skeels. Yeah, he was, he was lovely into uh, He was a member of work for the Cal Forestry Department. Had a uh, and I heard he's a really nice guy. I found some articles about him. And Helen were wonderful people. It's yeah. a great person. So I'm honored. I haven't had a fruit now, from that one yet. Dick and Alice Snow are the only ones left. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, and, and uh, uh, Leo's yeah. wife. Yes. Yeah. But the house is, I think, sold as of now. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have to call back the realer. 
So, um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be No, honestly, please do it because I could care less and I'm learning from you, so I appreciate it. Um, and I, I mean, I could do this all day. I could talk till midnight if you want. So uh, Paul died before learning, sadly, that is hybrids. He had basically eight seedlings, well, nine, and then two died in a frost, but not really. And anyways, Sven Meriton sent 13 cuttings from California rare fruit growers to Pine Island a long time ago, and they got renamed. And so sadly, Paul did not know that I mean, he people were talking about these fruit and saying, oh, purple haze is great. And he died without knowing that it was his his seedling, which is sad. And so you can see there's tons of varieties. Here's Alice, Alice Snow, American Beauty, Bloody Mary. Um, this one is a Bin Potier, polyrhizus I learned recently, Cosmic Charlie. So anyways, I did a little cheat sheet. I'll show you in a second. But I just want you to know that almost all those that Pine Island in Florida sold were actually California rare fruit growers. So I find that really interesting and kind of sad. Um, Leo, when he passed, his wife gave me everything, like all of the original books and, and information, and we scan stuff. And, and you can see this is actually one of the first uh, Pitahaya festivals, dragon fruit festivals. Yeah. And Sven was there and a few others. And what I find really interesting is that they ranked 3S, 2S, and 9S as way better than the rest. And 3S now is Delight, 2S is Cosmic Charlie, 9S is Dark Star. Yeah. So maybe you've heard of those, but those are all of his seedlings. And then perhaps one of the most useful things in this picture that's not that clear up here, but it is on, on my personal copy, is Rixford, because that one has been renamed and sort of lost over the years. And it's a really small, round, good quality fruit from what I said. So yes, very round and they say smaller. So a lot of people debate which is the real Rixford and and from Gray Martin, he says that everybody has the wrong one. Do you one. know where you're in Yes, okay. a little bit, yeah, he's yeah. He's a pig on yeah. Um, But he's forgotten some of the stuff for the years. Yeah. So um, very nice guy. I email him and I've talked to him on the phone and I actually saw him. He's in the, yeah, uh, he's in this presentation. Presentations at our festival of uh -huh. In the past years, yeah, um, yeah, he's one of the most uh, passionate speakers I've ever seen. I mean, that guy started talking about dragon fruit, and it was just like, whoa, like there's a fire within. Um, so you can see, just I find this really intriguing. It may not be the best picture, but this is just an interesting part of history from the early 2000s. And so again, they had all these varieties, but Paul's hybrids were a step above the rest. And if you want a little cheat sheet, here is the basically the seedling. So the this color pink um, is his Houghton and Neitzel hybrid, which uh, Houghton is a Slenocery cetaceous, a small red magenta sweet fruit and white. And um, it's funny because there's actually two Neitzels out there. Um, the one that most people have is a tribute after Neitzel passed. Jim passed, they named one. I believe the rare fruit growers named one. And then that one's a really delicious fruit. But I also found Leo had one called Jim Neitzel's Fence. And so that's the one that grew along his fence. And that's a totally different fruit. But I think that's the parent of this one. So most people that have Neitzel nowadays is the tribute plant. But a few people have his fence, which I believe is one of the parents, if that makes sense. So you can see 1S and the numbers all got these fancy names. Leo Manuel had 6S. I got one fruit from it, so I don't know if it's dead or not. I, I just want another season to evaluate the fruit longer, but it was a magenta flesh fruit. I have a fruit on 7S right now, which Leo also had. And again, these both supposedly died in the frost, but not before uh, Paul Thompson shared them with California rare fruit growers. So I still have those. This is the one that I can't find. So if anybody asks around, you ever find a 4S with a pale pink, I would do anything for that cutting almost. So that would be cool. Um, as you can see, 8S is another good one, but these two had a different parent, which was Houghton and Rixford, which is uh, produced a smaller red flesh fruit. And you can see there's Voodoo Child over there. And if, if you look at the differences of the plant structure, you'll see that they're very different. Um, I actually really kind of like these. They're smaller fruit. They're very fertile. They're usually first to bloom and last to bloom. Um, our friend Danny had uh, uh, ate us a sugar dragon bloom on Christmas Eve a few years ago. So they, they do kind of bloom a lot more frequently some of, some of the other varieties. Also, I should mention that Pine Island renamed them and they all kind of stuck with the theme of a lot of like jam bands. So like Dark Star and 
Purple Haze. And, you know, they used a lot of those Jimi Hendrix and, and Grateful Dead songs to kind of get inspiration, I guess. Edgar Valdivia, uh, he was a member uh, back in the late 90s. And he is a hybridizer. He's um, the father of the Asunta series. There's some Asuntas I saw out there. Um, and his goal was to make a day blooming flower, but he ended up with some really beautiful purple flowers. Uh, he's very passionate. And a lot of people think like, there's a lot of debate about his Asuntas like two and three. And then there's these names like Asunta three, oh, for one. And so long story short, He's like the nicest giving guy. And so he just gave away seedlings over the years. So there's all these sister seedlings out there in the world that, that are different variants. And um, he's actually just been doing some YouTube videos. I've, I've been watching him this week. It's great to see him. And he is kind of talking about the history and sharing his experience with some of the plants. So if you can find him on YouTube, just search Edgar Valdivia. And he put up like two videos in the past couple of weeks. And I really enjoy them. And um, you could see he had quite a list of hybrids himself. He has his Asuta series. They're up to, I think, six now or seven. Um, Alora, which is one that a lot of people like. Axe, which is Asunta unknown uh, pollen source. So X for unknown. And some others. Probably my favorite on this list. I really think Shayna's a good Guatemalan. I really, really like Edgar's baby a lot, which is a sister seedling of the Asunta series. So I don't want to bore you and confuse you, but basically a lot of his have those really pretty purple flowers. Now, the drawback is a lot of them are self-sterile, so they need to be cross-pollinated. Um, you can see some pictures of him back here at one of the festivals. Here's his first Asunta, Asunta 1, which bricks time, but was had a greenish skin, and it took a longer time to develop. And so this one's kind of hard to catch when it's ripe. A lot of people get them overripe. Also, you can see him here is he's looking at his plant Trisha that he hybridized and that was growing at Elk Creek Dragon Fruit Farm, which we'll talk about soon. So there's Edgar and his hybrids and he is still growing and teaching. I got to see him at the uh, festival releases Asunta 6 here that day. And I don't think I'd be here without seeing that presentation because that really inspired me. And now I have a couple hundred varieties, I hate to say, maybe 300, but well, let's not talk about that. Um, Another man that most people don't know is Eckhard Meyer, and he's actually an epiphyllum, uh, and he did do some dragon fruit hybridizing. He's a German, so he, he does it all in Germany. And long story short, some guy like Don Burnett and some others went and flew out there and got some of his really rare cuttings. But he actually created these three sisters. I heard somebody talking about him, Bruni, Connie Meyer, and Kathy Von Abram. And what he did is he hybridized a variety that's red a red flowered here called Hyloceris stenopteris, and he crossed it with a white undatus, and that's the flower that resulted. Now, if you like coconut vibes or floral, I guess people describe, the fruit's smaller. It's on the plant about, I don't know, 38 to 50 days, and, and they're smaller fruit, but they're really, really coconutty. And they bricks in the in the 20s, like they're really sweet. So my personal favorite of the three, I've, I've had two of the three. My I've had these two. My Kathy is giant, but it didn't bloom this season. But I really like Bruni, or some people call it Brunei, um, because it's it blooms really early in the season. And I actually have like six fruit on it right now, almost ripe. I was going to bring some, but they weren't quite ready. So those are some really great ones with some really beautiful flowers. And those ones actually grow quick. So like some of them, I think within a year, I went from a cutting to fruit. So, so these grow pretty quick, but grow through the winter. And then that branch doesn't need a whole season like some varieties. Um, he did tons of epis. He's really famous and kind of underrated. I mean, if you Google his name and search the epis, or he has a lot of stuff on Flickr. Um, really amazing things this man created, but mostly epis. He just, he, he grew this hybrid for the flowers. He didn't care about the fruit and he accidentally made some really good fruit. So that's uh, someone. And, and I hear that some people say that Edgar actually used one of these plants for his Asunta line. And I've never got the story straight if it's an epiphyllum that they use to get this flower or not. So nobody really knows, but in my humble opinion, Asunta and these flowers are very similar. I see a lot of similarities on the structure of the plants. Some people say they do. Yeah, so I have have not experienced it. However, I, I had a lot of Selenocereus 
fruit or flower. Fruit, yeah, they they accept the pollen really well. Yeah, I, I grow quite a few epis. Well, the hardest thing about epis too is they bloom way earlier. So well, they, they bloom earlier, so you'd have to save the pollen yeah, somehow. Well, somebody will bloom late, you know. But the experts say that uh, Hattelsers and Dots is actually Selenoceric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've been reclassified too. But I agree, but I'm still going to play with it and see because I, I have some of George's epis and stuff. So, but no luck yet, you're right. <laughs> and I'm not very optimistic. Now, last time I talked about this, I got a little choked up, so hopefully not. This guy is awesome. So um, hopefully you know about all the mangoes he did. I believe he was in the 70s in the rare fruit growers because he moved to Claremont and he grew a lot of stuff there. Um, and then he moved because uh, his wife, Betty, wasn't so happy. He, she liked Claremont, but he moved because he couldn't grow mangoes in Claremont. So he moved to um, off the 56 and, and Penasquitas. And he was there for a long time. North and Mira Mesa, kind of. Yeah, a little north of Mira Mesa, but wow. A little bit north yeah, right off that 56. Mesa, yeah. So, um, I mean, I, man, he's awesome. So I, I don't know if anybody raised their hands, if you got to ever see his Pattaya group and Yahoo, I, I never got to see it. They deleted it, but people just talk about it all the time and the wealth of information he shared and he moderated. Um, and also, I know that he distributed a lot of cuttings to the members over the years. Um, you can see this is uh, this was in the reader, and Jim Neitzel was at his house that day. I'll show you a picture of it. Um, but man, it's really funny how we became friends. So my wife works at uh, at Sharp Hospital, and long story short, I did some googling, and Leo actually still had this website called RareFruit.com. And two years ago, I would just be up late at night searching keywords for dragon fruit. And so I, I came across this one day and it was in Leo's post. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's selling or he sold in, in the 90s. He sold 4S, 6S, 7S. Well, these two were dead. And so I, it really caught on to me. And then I saw the other things he had. He had um, the G series, which G2, he had G1, G3. So anyways, I got really excited when I saw this. And I was like, wow, Leo had this. And everybody I contacted was like, Leo Manuel passed away. I was like, oh my gosh, when did he pass away? And nobody knew. And so I just started Googling. And, and long story short, I found this website. I searched it. I emailed Leo like 10 times. Just, dude, I want to buy the book. I want to learn from you. Like anything. Never got a reply. So I started to agree like, oh, maybe he did pass. So long, anyways, my wife works at Sharp Hospital. And I somehow came across where Leo wrote a post about his family once and his one of his daughters is a doctor at, at where, of course, the Sharp Hospital. So I asked my wife, I was like, hey, do you know a secret way to email people for, through your system? And she told it to me. I was like, oh my gosh, it works. And so I emailed his daughter, one of his daughters, he has two, Brenda and Peggy. And I emailed Peggy and I was like, I'm sorry your dad passed. Whatever happened to the house? What happened to the dragon fruit? I'm just a collector. I want to know the history. And she replies the next day and said, I'm really sorry to disappoint you, but he's still alive. <laughs> call him so I called him and he was like really I mean this was like two years ago so he was really old um maybe a, a lot of people don't know he actually was pollinating one time he fell and broke his back yeah. um got really hurt hurt his shoulder he would fall he had to wear a helmet like you saw in the first uh picture but anyways um he was skeptical of me at first I'll say he did not trust me which I, I look in the mirror I don't trust myself but um <laughs> <laughs> he uh he got to know me and he just started trusting me he's like okay go check out my stuff and he just once he knew kind of what i'm all about and no i'm not going to go cut his plants and go sell them on ebay or whatever um we became really close friends and so i he, i would just go to his house spend hours going through his labels taking pictures taking a few cuttings you know asking about the history and so we just started hanging out like quite a bit especially um after he got vaccinated because COVID was a thing. He was really elderly. I was worried about him. So we were just pen pals for like a year. And then once we got vaccinated, I just started hanging out with him like once, twice a month. I mean, whenever he'd let me. So um, I got to go to this wonderful place. And, and to me, it was, I call it the Dragon Fruit Museum. And so he had this huge historical collection. You know, he didn't just have a 
a label on a plant that was gone. He had labels on the plant. He had metal tags. He had a list of papers. He had documentation. He had the year he got it. He got who gave it to him, like a wealth of information. Like I, I one of my favorite things is I have um, Adis, which was renamed to Sugar Dragon. And it's the oldest one I've found. And it's like before they even named it the S8, it was just number eight. And it had all these different names. And, and it just said 117 2001 <laughs> I was like, wow, that's an old plant. And it was almost dead. It was like termites were eating it. And so I cut it back and it's growing now. But anyways, um, he passed in May and we didn't know what to do. And so I was, uh, it was, he had a lot of watering problems. I was fixing a lot of his irrigation. Um, it was, it was a nightmare for irrigation there. I mean, I was saving his mango trees. They weren't getting water. So anyways, I spent a lot of time fixing his plants and then Tom almost came one day, or you, you, you came to help me repot, and, and Leo wasn't there. And he had fallen that night before and was in the hospital. It was really sad, but uh, <clears throat> I don't want to talk about that now. So anyways, he passed, and his family let me buy his collection. So I bought his collection thinking, okay, I can move these in like a week. Not a problem. <laughs> 38 truckloads later, I finished wow. and it took like four months and, uh, but it was, it was a repotting nightmare. It was a relabeling nightmare. You know, I was fixing the irrigation. They were trying to give me time before they sold the house. It was, it was just crazy how it worked out, but it worked out. And so um, these were some of Leo's favorites, if you care. And what's funny is, is he had this spot. He had a lychee tree here. He had a mango tree here that died and he removed it and it was just this spot and so he asked me we decided we'd build this little tre uh, trellis the Israeli style we call it high density and so I built this for him and we were supposed to taste these fruit and uh, his favorite was 5s which was renamed purple haze and then he really liked neon and he got that from David Archer and I called David Archer and talked to him and he couldn't remember where he sourced it, but he found it a long time ago by the border. And I thought it was Sugar Dragon for a while, but long story short, those fruit are different and neon slightly better in my opinion. I mean, I really like that plant. And then Orton Engelhart is a white flesh one and, it, and it's back there if you got to try the white flesh, it's kind of grayish and it may not taste the best, but Leo said that that one was the most important to him because of who gave it to him. And Orton Engelhart, I learned later that he invented the rainbird uh, sprinkler. So this one's really historic. I put some cuttings back there. So if anybody, it may not taste the best, but it was really important to Leo. Out of the G series, there's G1, G2, G3. They're all similar. And I believe there's actually two variants of G2. And G3 grew the fastest and the best and bloomed the first. So Leo really liked G3. He had like seven pots of it. Um, 4S, it ended up being, I have not he got it straight from Paul Thompson and that one is wrong. So I gave it to like four or five people. So I regret that now, um, but that's life success. I'm still evaluating. I'm not sharing that one. And seven S I'm sharing because that one's special. And that's a sister of sugar dragon. And so Leo liked all these, we pulled them all up. I planted them all. And then he started, I started to find his hybrids and he crossed like seven S with neon. And he had so many hybrids. I have like 50 pots of his hybrids. I don't even know what to do with them yet. I'm evaluating I'd be happy to. Right now, I'm focusing on the history, but at any basics, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, um, if you want, you could go to the YouTube channel. That would be a great place, but I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. Um, the premise of this presentation is the history. So, um, but I'd be happy to help you in any way possible. Okay. All right. Um, Leo's dragons, well, he has so many hybrids. And what he did is he crossed a Selenoceres megalanthus with a Costa Recensis, and he grew like 30 seedlings, I think. I, well, at least like at least 15. I have over 30 pots of that cross, and there's so many differences. Some are red fleshed, some are purple fleshed, some are spiny, some are not. So he grew a lot. And then over the years, I found like there's one called Leo's dragon, which is a red one, which is one of them. Costa Rican Sunset, I believe, is one of his. Yellow Cross 68, I believe, is one of his. But again, he had 20, and, and it's actually closer to 30 pots 
of these um, hybrids that he see the seedling seed group. And some I'm evaluating, some have been great. And then what's really funny is he pulled out, he was really, this is right before he's in the hospital, but he pulled out this bag. He had his, his wife go get it out of, the, out of the fridge. I'll never forget. And he pulls this thing out. And he's like, Paul, try this. This is my favorite hybrid. It's like, okay, how old is it, Dio? He's like, eh, a few. <laughs> Put it in my mouth. It's like, man, it actually tastes good. You free, and he, he dehydrated them, of course. He did it and he kept it in his fridge. I was like, what, it's a few months old? He's like, a few years. And it was more like eight to 10 years. So, then, and so I didn't get sick, but um, I ate it and he told me to save some because you could see it's magenta fleshed. And remember out of all these seedlings, most are red, there's a few magentas. And so um, he told me after I ate it, I didn't get sick. And then he said, well, grow some seeds. And I didn't think it would work, but I have seedlings of those growing right now in my greenhouse. So you can dehydrate dragon fruit and leave them out for in your fridge for 10 years and they'll still produce fruit apparently. So um, that was one of my favorite memories of him. Uh, you could see, I, I, I don't know for sure, I can never prove it, but you can see that some of these places are selling some of his hybrids. Here's one, everybody calls Leo's dragon, but it's weird because <clears throat> Leo's pot at his house uh, that says Leo's dragon is magenta, but this one is red. So not sure what happened there. And then there's the Costa Rican sunset, which for at one point Leo told me he was going to name them that. So there's Costa Rican dragon, Costa Rican sunset. But can I ever prove it? No, but I can try. Um, I added this slide just because I like, this is like Jim Neitzel's coolest quote. He said, how do I say that mango? Kite, ket, ket. He said the cat is named after some dude who for some reason didn't know how to spell his own name. That's fine. I love that quote. He's at Leo's house right there um, at, at the back fence. And um, I just really like that for some reason. But um, I wanted to add Jim Neitzel because one, I have a respect for him. I grow his some of his bananas. I have his San Jose bananas and a few other things. Um, and then that fence on Dennis is really important because I think that was the, one of the parents of Paul's breeding program. And also he shared Neitzel and Dadis. He shared one called Leo's Best Red. I don't have it, but people do, rare fruit growers do, and much more. Mm -hmm. So I think Jim belongs in this founding fathers. I know he shared a lot of, uh, of uh, cuttings over the years to members. So um, I'm happy to grow a couple of his. Now, something that most people don't know is that most of the farms today grow cuttings from this place. And yeah, this is Elk Creek dragon fruit. They're up in uh, Fallbrook. And they are the reason why commercial farms are in San Diego today. And so any farm you go to, I've interviewed them all. Um, they all tell me where they got their cuttings from. And it's from this place. Now, sadly, Linda has retired. She's, she breeds dogs, Linda Nickerson. And she actually renamed some of Paul Thompson's, like she, she's the one that named Sugar Dragon. And her husband, Gerard Kozlau, he passed away as well. And you can see him there on the quad, but um, they are the most important farm, like I said, because all the farms today grow cuttings from them. Mm -hmm. And so um, they even had some really special things. And I even found some of Leo's plants at the farm. So really special place. You could see it closed down in 2020, 2021. They had a really special collection that people would share over the years. They even had some of, um, I believe, Gray Martin's plants. And they had hybrids of Leo and others. But the problem was, is um, as I went through that farm, they weren't very good at the labeling. So you got to be really careful about that. And you can't just name one, you know, Jimmy's treat, because I think that could be disrespectful to the hybridizers. So you can see here's a 2008 photo I found of the varieties that they were growing commercially back then. I see some of them over there. Um, Sabra, which is a great red flesh. Maria Rosa, which was a no ID. Orjona, Lisa, Sugar Dragon, S9, which is Dark Star. Ben Hoy White, which was a rename. This is 3S. And this is probably the most intriguing thing, at least to me, that I can find is American Beauty was considered the same as G2. And they are not the same historically. So I'm um, doing some research and Gray Martin has been helpful. And he told me that basically, and Romero, they all said that um, Pine Island basically had two varieties in every pot. They would tell the guy, go get cuttings of this one. And the guys just cut whatever off of those plants. Mm -hmm. So they had two varieties in each pot. So nobody really knows. 
Um, I mean, there's I, I could talk even more about Quang Ong and stuff, but not today. But basically, a lot of them. I mean, this is a problem because again, these are basically two varieties that people consider the same, and that's a problem. Now, I wanted to add Romero Lobo. I believe he came and talked coffee with you guys recently. Um, he man, last month. yeah. So he's really one of the most key figures to me now because he's been doing the research. Uh, he's been into it. I believe I was reading this article last night and he has been into Pita Hayes since childhood. And so he does a lot behind the scenes. He works for the small farms and agricultural economics advisor. UCCE. And, yes. And um, you can look him up online. UCNR is a way where you can find a lot of their resources, but you can see how long he's been doing it. Um, really nice guy. And he was, uh, he's in charge of the festival. So I think he's really important. He also, uh, they did a lot of work where they researched 20 varieties for commercial potential and evaluated them. And you can find that by Googling ECNR, or I'll, we'll share this hopefully with you because that's the link. All I did was Google Romero Lobo UCNR and this popped up. And so you can go and they evaluate all 20 varieties. They talk about cold tolerance, heat tolerance, how to grow them, pollination, how long the, the you expect them. And then for me, it's useful because I could see what they look like back then. So the flowers and the fruit, I can compare them to what people have given me now. So really important uh, gentleman, in my humble opinion, uh, Romero Lobo. And he is... Really, if you want to learn about the pit of higher on that, mm -hmm. the UCCE has the best dossier on different avocado varieties. Oh. They have a wonderful um, dissertation, basically A to Z. It's not quite like Julie Frink's presentation, mm -hmm. but it, uh, it, it's like a Anaheim to Zucano, but it tells if it's type A, type B, Thin skin, thick skin, uh, fruiting. So they check in commercial potential as well. Part of UCCE, okay, out of Riverside. Mm -hmm. And uh, just for for those of you, I had a person that asked me about avocados tonight, and their web is one of the best mm -hmm. on that. So yeah, I spent hours of my life going through the UCNR things, and they gave us at the festival. They gave us a lot more. Yes. Um, and so some of us got to go to the festival tour and uh, they do a production tour. We went to two farms and evaluated and learned from them. But to me, I think I got the most out of some of the experts speaking. So we learned about some of the bugs. There's these fire ants that are really destructive to dragon fruit. Luckily, I only have Argentine ants in my yard, but the fire ants are messing up the farms pretty well. And they don't really have much to combat them yet, except for bait traps. Um, diseases, that was probably the most depressing presentation I've ever seen because basically they said 87% of all dragon fruit we tested have CVX, which is cactus virus X, which basically means everybody's got it. Um, and so, uh, however, a lot of them were asymptomatic. So I found that was really intriguing. Um, I will ask Romero if I can have permission to share this with you guys because I have the PDFs. Um, but I'm not sure if I'm allowed to share them. And I'm sure a lot of you could probably get something out of it because CBS affects not just Hyloceris and Selenoceris, many other uh, cacti. So um, I really appreciate the work that they're doing. They're working with a lot of farms right now in Southern California. And I'm excited to see what the future beholds for commercial potential dragon fruit. A little side note about me. Um, I went from collecting all the varieties, I have over 300, to now I'm getting rid of the ones that don't taste good, in my opinion. I'm evaluating them. And now my goal is to hybridize high-quality fruit that has a commercial potential, but also I want to do ones that fruit later in the season. Because I've been talking and working with a lot of the farms recently, and, and everybody gets their fruit at once. And so it's this huge mass of fruit, mm -hmm. and that affects prices. And then they're worried about the global competition. So I'm working with actually um, sumo citrus. I don't know if you guys have ever had the sumo citrus, really great citrus fruit. It's related to Mandarin, but the people in charge of that, the George family, um, they're actually getting into dragon fruit. So I've been working with them and I hope that they can kind of do a co-op to really develop this further, but they're in the same mentality where we want to do some like Desert King stuff or Megalanthus where the fruit's going to be ripe later in the season. 
So maybe December, January, February, and that would really probably benefit the market. So that's kind of what I'm doing. So this summer, I spent a lot of time taking my megalanthus plants and hybrid uh, cross pollinating them to hopefully get some fruit that will take like four months to ripen on the vine. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I'm at now. And um, like I said, I'd be happy to help anybody that wants to learn or start and uh, dragon fruit is awesome. So that's all I have, I think. Um, thank you for your time. If you need any resources, there I am. And uh, appreciate you coming. Uh, yellow, I have, uh, I've, I've, I have, I got a huge fruit, a Pallora fruit a few years ago, and I, I was able to clone graft the plant off of it. And it bricks to a 25. The reason I'm asking is I have a friend whose daughter has got an illness, and she said the only thing that helps her is the yellow dragon fruit. Really? Not the red. Uh huh. Uh, Something to do with the yellow and the bigger seeds, maybe? I mean, you know, white flesh 